a day doesn't go by without somebody saying something that can make me angry. <laughs> Honestly, there are people who would respond to you on your tweet. You, you just posted a tweet and they said, but that's, is, is, is that not obvious what you're saying? Um, some would say, um, you know what? That is nonsense. You know, <laughs> I know what I do. So sometimes a lot of businesses, they don't fail because they don't have a good product. They don't fail because they don't get have a good idea. But they fail because they go leaving their capacities outside. Mm. One say there's times where your competition is just as good as you. Mm, mm. And I think that statement alone took away my ego. Mm, mm. To say, look, you're not the best out there. Deal with it. Exactly. Get used to it. Just mm. be comfortable with, with the fact that there are many good people out there. Mm, mm, and mm. you're just one of many. The only thing you can beat people who are just as good as you is outwork them. And the beauty about it is that don't, don't be jealous of successful people. Mm. No. And don't be jealous of your competitors. And don't be jealous of those who are doing things best. No. Tell yourself, I want to learn how they do it. Because the, the temptation is that we get jealous of people. And the moment you get jealous, you start talking bad about them. What's your favorite topic in entrepreneurship? <laughs> Anything. <laughs> 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 Anything legal, I'm okay. <laughs> ah, yes. All right. Anything Welcome. Legal. Welcome to this edition of Mindset Profits. I am sitting with uh, someone who coaches us coaches. <laughs> so this is me. I, I wish I had a pen and paper to just take some notes because it's going to be truly one of those mm. episodes. I'm sitting with the one and only oh, Mr. Derek Zavi, and he is, he has led for the past couple of years one of South Africa's biggest professional bodies that manages us coaches and business advisors, but he is an entrepreneur, an experienced entrepreneur, content creator as well, which is surprising, Mr. Zavi. That's one thing that surprises me about you. Uh, I would expect you to struggle more than me with social media, but you are the most consistent person I have seen in a while. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dando, for having me and at Mindset Profit uh, Podcast. Yeah. And thank you for introduction. Mm. And uh, truly, show is that uh, when it comes to content, um, I don't know, I've learned that if I have to make it in this life now, <laughs> if I have to make profit, if I have to end, <laughs> I have to make sure that I create consistency in terms of how we build the content, you know, and around everything that has to be there. Mm. And also understanding your market to say, who are they? Who are your audience? You've got Christians, you've got atheists, you've got, <laughs> <laughs> you've got Muslims, you've got, you know, all these religions. And you have to find a way to say, how do I fit into all these categories mm. and still get a business out of that? You know? Also, mm. yours, your, the way you treat content is with intention and you want to get business out of it. You're not just posting for the sake of... Mm, actually, uh, let, let's, let's, put it, let's be very clear. Um, it's for business, right? Mm. But at the same time, it's to say, uh, how do I identify myself? I'm a Christian and that... No one can take away that away from me. Mm. Um, but that also assisted me to understand that if the beginning of wisdom is to fear God, then it means that it doesn't matter even if my 80% of my content can be Christianity, I'll be okay with it mm. because that is putting God first. Mm. And for me to get business, I have to understand that it's God. It's God's favor. So sometimes as Christians, we tend to hide away the godly part of things, you know. Mm -hmm. Even when we share the content, we don't want to talk about, you know, God. We don't want to talk because we feel like it's going to chase clients away. Yeah. I'd rather lose clients than to lose God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it makes sense. For someone who doesn't know you, how do you introduce yourself? 
Well, I introduce myself as an entrepreneurologist. Uh, ah. The term that a lot of people <laughs> better to say and all that. Uh, yeah, but um, why that term? It's more of saying, look, we are dealing with entrepreneurs and um, dealing with entrepreneurs, the mindset and all that. So when I advise or deal with uh, businesses, it's not about your business that you give to me to say, let's help. But I have to say first, what about you as an entrepreneur? Are you ready? Is your mindset ready and all that? So that's where I came with the, you know, the word and all that. But I realized that a lot of people are using it now and I'm happy, you know, but yeah, and initially you'd find that I'm maybe you among the, the two or the three, you know, because I was happy when I checked, I saw one of the guys in the U, is it the UCT, uh, the University of Cape Town? You know, like entrepreneurologists, I was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's getting there. So, yeah, but yeah, that, that's, that's it. But the bottom line is that I'm just a certified business advisor and who offers business advisory, you know, to individuals and to businesses and to corporate. And currently uh, I'm heading the Institute of Business Advisors in South Africa, you know, where I'm serving the SNMD. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and also I would say that I've been into a number of um, activities and a number of um, um, uh, enterprise development, you know, to see if I can assist in terms of reaching out to small businesses. How long have you been doing this? This whole enterprise development, <laughs> you're laughing. <laughs> I'm laughing because uh, how I started, it's, it's quite interesting because I started it in 1996 when I came to Johannesburg. So I came to Johannesburg in 1996. A very long time ago. Yeah. So 1996, I came to Johannesburg and I started working for different companies uh, until I think it was in the year 2000 where I joined Discovery Health, right? Mm. And when I joined Discovery Health and I was happy working there and one day I saw the big boss, you know, uh, Mr. Adrian Gore walking around. I said, that's our boss. I was like, wow, he's still young. And <laughs> uh, trust you me, that's when I said, you know what, can I go and start my own business, you know, also. Oh, you saw him and I got saw challenged him. by the I fact was that he was inspired, a, you know, to yeah. say such a great idea, putting together, hiring people. Can I go and do the same? And when I left, I left to go and register a company. And guess what was the name of the company? Mm. New Discovery. Oh, Business Solutions. That was it. Nice. And then I think that was in the year 2000. And I started the business, but the main idea for the business was to say, I want to go into consulting, but mainly to say, how do I assist entrepreneurs? You know, because I realized that a lot of people, for them to register companies and all that, they have to rely to, you know, the lawyers, attorneys, you know, you go to, you have to go to the attorney to get your company set up and all that. And I realized that, you know what, maybe we can emerge as business consultants that will focus on business advisory and see how we can do that. But now, if you don't have businesses to advise, where do you start? So mm. I had to start with registering companies, right? And <laughs> say, you know what? I want to register companies. And from the companies that I'm registering, I want to make sure that some of these businesses are the ones that I'm going to advise so that they can grow to the next level. Mm -hmm. And it worked because I know that over the years, there are companies that have registered uh, in the year 2002, 2000, and I'm still consulting with them even today. Whoa. Yes, I'm still, I'm still there. They still need me. They still talk to me. They still want advice from me. And over and above that, it, it became easier to grow, you know, from there. And I remember in the year 2008, when we had the recession, the first recession of the new, of the <laughs> new generation. Mm. And when the recession hit, I had to think, where will, how will I feed the family? How will I take care of the bills? And I just called one of the companies that I assisted and said, listen, man, I just want to work with you for three days. And I want you to pay me so much for those three days. Mm. And I'm going, coming to assist you. I agreed. Went there, got the office, started working. And we did a project, I remember there, we got a contract with one of the big hotels and we worked together. So there I was more like a you know, compliance officer. Imagine from being a business <laughs> advisor. But it worked because it allowed me to now have to advise the entire team. You know, in, instead of in advising the founder, the founder, then now I have to now deal with the entire team. And then from there I have to liaise with the client also. You know, 
and and you know it was very interesting because the client would have more interest to say you know what why don't you run this company i was like <laughs> no 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 i'm running it because i'm here to help the owner to run it better so i'm okay with it so i'm mm-hmm. okay where i am you know and we run it very nicely and until mm-hmm. i think 2012 when i realized things are back to normal and i said i'm going back to the market because I think this is one thing a lot of entrepreneurs need to learn to say. If you are running a business, don't be so rigid to say, this is what I'm doing. You know, I have to do it. You have to adjust and say, now the conditions are not favorable. favorable yeah. How do I readjust myself? How do I realign? How do I readjust my uh, sales you know, <laughs> for the ship now to take the direction that the economy is taking? So when I came back to the market, now... Everything was dry <laughs> for coaching. Guess what? I had to think, hang on, I have social media platforms that I've created in 2009. Mm. And I had Facebook, I had Twitter. On Facebook, I still remember I was sitting at, then I was, you know, Facebook, you know, you can reach 5,000 or whatever, you know, in a space of, short space or whatever mm. but now i had twitter account which now was having 60 followers right mm-hmm. in 2016 or 60 60 okay in 20, 2012 when now i had to relaunch myself mm. and i realized that with facebook it was good but now you get to a point where you kind of reach a ceiling you know you can't grow beyond mm. and i said now what must i do because i see twitter and all that so i went to twitter mm. what i did is i took the same content that i was posting on facebook, facebook take it to twitter and guess what i saw the numbers like rising <sighs> but also you need to understand um in as much as we get into these platforms we need to understand that we are not celebrities. We are entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> so as an entrepreneur, you need to build a community. How? Because in this case, you would not DM me if I don't follow you mm. or we don't follow each other. It yeah. was difficult. And also, even if you DM me, it would go into you know other mails, not the main ones. Mm. So what I did is I would follow people that I would that realize this is a business wow, this is Dando. Dando is doing business and this guy can be my client. I would follow you. Oh, And then from there you would come into my DM, you know, and everybody that would like or everybody that would say something on my TM, TL, mm. I would make sure that I follow them. Why? Because I knew that this person has interest in what I'm doing and what I'm saying. So this person might have interest in reaching out to me, but can I remove this stumbling block? That sounds like so much work, though. Are you still doing that now? No, not now. Because you uh, But let me just say not now, because I don't want people who are following me and I'm not following <laughs> back. And they're thinking, hang on, so this guy doesn't follow me deliberately. No, 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 no. I yeah. still do that. But now it's, got, it's difficult, because if you are followed by probably, let's say, 100 people a day, mm. you can't follow them back, all of them. Yeah, but if somebody sends me a DM and say, or try to reach out to me. I say, I'm trying to reach out to you. I'll make sure that I connect with that person immediately. So yeah, I would would say that from there it grew. And then I remember I had 36,000 followers and somebody, you won't believe, somebody said to me, I said something on Twitter. Somebody said, no, you are a public figure. You are, your your account is like, I was like at 36,000, I'm a public figure. When I've got people that are having one million followers? No, mm-hmm. it can't be, you know? So, but yeah, I, I started to kind of rethink how I post, how I behave. Well, now you have to be a bit more intentional. Uh, yes, and then to understand that if, if let's say, you see this account of a top politician following you, now you start to think, what am I saying? <laughs> am I still behaving the same way or do I change? And then you start to see this pastor following you and you, so this, this kind of, you, you, it, it taught me to say sometimes you don't grow by learning a lot, but by observing a lot. What do you mean? No. That sounds deep. Great. Cool. <laughs> I'll, I'll unpack it. Sometimes by observing, you grow yeah. without reading, without learning. Mm. Right. By observing how people respond towards you, by observing how you respond towards certain situations, then you mm. grow. Because that taught me to say, 
I don't have to get, let's say, so and so to tell me who they are, how they do things. I have to observe and look at them, how they do things, and say, if I want to attract them, if I want them to stay connected to me, if I don't want them to unfollow me, mm. how do I reshape my content so that they stay connected to me? Because if you look at the name of somebody that would say, so and so follows you, then you know that it, it kind of boosts your, your, your account also. <laughs> so I think that's when I started to take seriously and from there would now start to categorize my... Uh, maybe that we are focused much on social media. It's okay. You know? <laughs> no, so, we've moved <laughs> okay, years. great. So I think for me, it was a question of now categorizing to say now, how do I now start to be intentional but create a program? So the program was to say, in the morning, mm. throw a verse, talk about God, talk about your Christianity, your faith, and all that. But as they progress, start mm. f following your content of maybe business advisory and all that. And then afternoon, you must know there have been a lot of news flowing. <laughs> so you have to now bring that content into the day. Then I started to do that. Then in the evening, people are talking about generations, are talking about, you know, Isibaya and all that, are talking about idols. How do you fit into that? So I had to say, now let's look at the content that will relate to that, you know, and all that. And then, yeah, so from there you go to sleep and all that. But yeah, I think for me also, I... So your posting schedule there would be average three times a day? <laughs> Now it's average three times a day. But then it was more like it would even be 10 times in a day. Whoa! Yes, it would be even 10 times in a day. But also you need to understand that the more you post, there are those who would like it and there are those who would unfollow you because of your <laughs> posting. So you have to bring the balance there. So, um, but, but when I read, is it Taylor Swift or, Swift or somebody, that this lady would tweet maybe once in a six months, but she would still get followers. That would still follow. You know? <laughs> but again, you can't compare with those people because they, they are running their content outside the media, social yeah. media. Yes, I mean, they are running concerts and all that. I mean, if she has a concert that draws maybe one million people, mm. all those people are going to follow her, whether she's on there or not, because that's where people are looking for. So I think for me, that's another thing. But also, um, maybe... When now I started to work with like your government, you know, and your companies and all that, because now they started to have interest to say, you know what, uh, can you come do this for us? Can we work with you on this and all that? But then I realized that a lot of people um, started to kind of connect with me using social media, decision makers, you know, mm. and also... I had to bring the balance to say not only Twitter, we have LinkedIn, we have, uh, you know, all these platforms and all that. So I had to balance all these things to say, how do we keep the balance? So that on LinkedIn, you know, there are people who are on LinkedIn that you can connect with. On mm -hmm. Twitter, there are people on Twitter and all that. But Twitter for me is a trump card, you know, because that's where you are able to engage freely. You don't have this thing of saying you have to be professional because you're on LinkedIn. <laughs> and yeah, so, so you have to bring that balance. And then, but yeah, I found it very, very positive in terms of how I built my career and, you know, building my business to where it is today. And I'm so grateful for social media, I must say. Are you not scared of Twitter at any point? Because that's the platform where people can really go for you. Look, People go for you if you are... It depends on how do you engage people. Right. It? Yes. It depends. I don't know. I've <laughs> stayed away from that. Like you, are, you won't believe. <laughs> you won't believe. A day doesn't go by without somebody saying something that can make me angry. <laughs> Honestly, there are people who would respond to you on your tweet. You, you just posted a tweet and they said, but... That's, is, is, is that not obvious, what you're saying? Um, some would say, um, you know what? That is nonsense, you know? I know what I do. I just go block and move on with life. <laughs> <laughs> I won't even, I don't even stress, I don't even think twice. If you say something, I won't even respond to you. 
Because also, I don't want to shame people or I don't want to take advantage of people because some of these people, they need help. You know, some you'll ignore because you realize this person needs help. But if they persist, you just block and continue with a peace of mind. So it doesn't mean that every day you don't get people who are, who are saying whatever they want to say about you or in your platform. No, you do get those people. But it's, it's just for you to decide and say, you know what? Do I entertain this? No. Do I engage this? No, I don't. Some will just come, you know, and say, hey, I sent you an email. You did not even respond. And here you are on Twitter, you know, <laughs> and, and talking and all these things. But yeah, and you, you just have to find a way to say, how do I respond to this? Some of them you have to go to their DM and say, you know what? I saw your message about me not responding to your email. I'm very sorry. I must have missed it. Mm-hmm. And they, some will come back and say, you know what? No, I understand. Can we engage further? Some will tell you straight, no, you're lacking ethics. I'm moving forward, you know. But, but um, humility and um, that understanding that you're dealing with human beings and also you are not becoming big, you know, mm. uh, yourself, um, that would allow people to, because there are some tweets, you may not even defend it yourself, but people will defend you. Will defend you. People will engage it and say, no, 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 but you can't say that to him. You know, and and instead of yes yeah, coming back and say, yeah, you can't say it. no, no, no. You just chill and go to bed nicely and tell yourself, I'll wake up, and when I wake up, I will have re-energized, refreshed, and I'll still continue with what I'm doing. That's wow. how it is. That's but interesting I, for me, actually. Mm, but yeah. also, again, if, even if you are busy in life, mm-hmm. you get busy because sometimes I would I would get a project where you'd find that I would not even tweet for the whole week. Mm. Right, because I'm busy. But I realize that I need to balance. I need to tell myself, this is like a radio station. This is like a mm. podcast, mindset, <laughs> you know, yes. profit podcast. Every Tuesday it has to drop something. Whether I'm angry, whether I had a bad day or whatever, if I have an interview that must go on, it must happen. <laughs> mm. So so for me, that is how it is. So um, because you need to understand that you are more like a, um, um, shares in a JSC. Mm. Shares, they gain value, they lose value based on who says what, who does what, what is it said about this company, is it good, is it bad? And mm. the only person who can tell a good story about you is yourself. So if you're not telling a story, you're not creating the opportunity if, for your value to increase. Exactly. If, and if you don't tell a story about yourself, somebody will tell a story <coughs> about you that you may not like. <laughs> so you need, to, you need to allow that. You know, I remember when I joined uh, Twitter, there was only one person with the name Derek Lungwan. And that man, I, I really honor him because he was based in Malamlele as a sculptor. When you okay. Google the name, my name, mm. his name would come first. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> But today, when you Google, it's my name all over first, you know. Mm. But then it's about what you feed. What is it that? What content do you bring in? So the more content you post or you share, the more now you become like, um, I would say, you, you, I, I was checking Google one day and it said, it said, what am, am I? Internet personality. I was like, oh, hey, okay. Okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. I guess I need to up my game. What does it mean? <laughs> so, so, but I realized that all it means is that this person is active on the internet. You know, that's it. So, 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 these are the things that you just need to tell yourself. But I think we are more focused on the, you know, I would say that the personal branding because that's that's where it, it hinges to to say if you're really serious about your personal branding, you'll be serious about how you position yourself, how you. You know, because even if when you look at my social media account, you'll find that it's the same uh, name throughout. Okay. Yeah, same name, thread, Twitter, whatever. Your personal brand is well managed. Yeah, so (laughs) same. And then the pictures also is the same. So you can't go to LinkedIn and when you search me via LinkedIn, you find a different picture. If I change the picture. You change it across. I change everywhere. If I change my description of what I do, who I am, and all that, I change it across. Because for me, that, that, that's what it's all about. Because when you look for me, you must find the same person, not two different personalities. Mm. When I'm on Facebook, I'm this Brady or whatever, you know? No. <laughs> <laughs> I want 
today I want to help some people who mm. are starting up in business and those that are thinking of starting in business. In your experience coaching and mentoring among small business owners, what what mistakes do you see people making when they're getting started? And the kind of mistakes that you make when you're starting and you carry through out and you struggle later. Mm. I I think most of the people they are struggle is to understand one thing or two things that when you start a business you need to understand that there must be internal capacity mm-hmm. and there must be external capacity. Okay. Internal capacity is what is it that you know about what you want to do? Have you done enough research on what you want to do? Mm-hmm. Have you studied enough about what you want to do? Mm-hmm. Before you even start. Because a lot of people would go and start a business. Only when they are there they realize that they've got competitors. <laughs> <laughs> when they've invested a lot of their money and time. Actually, let, let me put it this way. It's more like buying a car. Mm. When you buy a car, before you buy that car, you don't see that there are cars similar to that car. <laughs> Only when you buy it and you start driving it, you realize, eh, hey, wow. This thing is not unique. We are many here and you just start flickering everybody and hooting, beep, you know. <laughs> Just to say, hey, I see you, you know. The same with business. But unfortunately with business, you can't do that because these are your competitors. They are taking your share. <laughs> then you kind of get, you know, grumpy and all that. But had you known before, you would have known that at that corner, there is so-and-so, they are selling what I'm selling. They are doing what I'm The same with Mindset Profits podcast. How many mm-hmm. podcasts are out there? There's thousands. Actually, Actually it's what you were saying. I didn't know there's <laughs> thousands of these things starting everywhere, every yeah. month, until I started. And a couple, it took about six months to get to a thousand subscribers. So uh-huh. during that journey, you're checking and seeing uh, yes. how to get to a thousand. And then I saw how many podcasts are starting up in South Africa. Exactly. There's thousands. Exactly. And we're all doing similar things. So <laughs> those who are going to survive are the ones that have done internal capacitation. You see, because you already know there are many there. You already know for me to stay, I need to be consistent. I need to make sure if I say every Thursday or Tuesday I'm recording, it has to happen. If I said to clients, I'm going to upload content every week, it must happen. Mm. And those are the ones that are going to survive, you know. But then it it, it boils down again to external capacity, right? Mm. I re- remember when we walked in here, he said, hey, one of my guys, man, he's not feeling well and he's yeah. not here and all that. And I could tell that, you know what? You, you're kind of stressed. You can tell that you won't get exactly what you were looking what for, right? To. Yes. But what did you do? You just had to call somebody and say, please come and stand in, you know. Mm-hmm. But some people would still continue without capacity. And now the quality will not be the same. You see, what you're going to give now, it's not going to be the same because you lack capacity. So sometimes a lot of businesses, they don't fail because they don't have a good product. They don't fail because they don't get have a good idea, but they fail because they go leaving their capacities outside. Mm. Whether because some of the businesses you'd find that good intentional idea it may as it may, all that it needs it it just need a touch of a lawyer. Okay. Yeah, you need just an hour, one hour, two hours with a lawyer, or it needs a signature of an account. It needs an accountant, or it needs. So these are the things that if you can understand. It, it's like engineering. You, you want to develop a product. You can't develop a product where you know that you must submit it at SABS for approval and all that. Mm. And yet you don't have somebody that understands these standards to advise you. Mm. It, it doesn't work that way. Get you. Yeah. So, so we need to have those capacities because for me at the end of the day, Tando, is that we are selling what people have been selling for years. Mm. We are doing what people have been doing for years. The only thing is capacity to say how do we capacitate what we have, our ideas, how do we get a team to work with, how do we get a team that we can deliver what we want to deliver. Product is there, but the team that must deliver, it's a different story and altogether. partnerships to outsource. Collaborations, partnerships, you know, um, uh, you know, team that you can work with, hiring people, um, contracting people, consulting with people who know what, what they're doing, then it can help you. Because at the end of the day, 
uh, you you get you get you get somebody that would say, "Hey, here came these guys. They are selling their clothes online, and now because if you are not careful, what you're gonna do is mm. you will try to use your country laws to fight your competitors, but it may not." <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to mention companies here. I, I, I saw it. That was you see, and you start, you start to fight people, you know, using the company laws, the country. I mean, you talk about from US, TikTok, whoever. The fight is about this is the competition. And it's wiping us out. Yeah, it's taking us out. So what you're going to do is you run to your country's laws and say, ah, you know what? These guys, they are not paying tax. They are not, but they, they are here. They are competing. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? So I think those are the things that are very critical. But also, I think um, maybe on, on lastly on this one is that if you are an entrepreneur, don't start a podcast if you don't have engineering background or camera background. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I want to start a podcast then, mm. with all my heart, right? But I realized that I don't have a camera. I'm still using a phone, okay? Mm. I don't have light, you know? Mm. And I'll tell you one thing. What I've done now is that I'm buying assets one by one. I'm buying everything now. I'm starting to buy those things, mm. you know? And, and because I realized that if I'm really going to do this right, I need a team. So, so for me, I think... Also, if you don't know about, or you don't have idea, study. That, that brings us back to internal capacity. Study, know how things are functioning, and then so that by the time you start, even if nobody's there, you can still run the show yourself. I like the capacity one, particularly because, like we were saying earlier, I discovered there was thousands of podcasts. Mm -hmm. So to build internal capacity, I had to talk to other content creators and say, guys, how does this game work? <laughs> there is one, a couple of them actually, that gave mm -hmm. me really great advice. One was telling me to take five episodes, put them out because at that point, I didn't know what would work for me. Mm -hmm. And I was never experienced with the camera work, mic work, nothing. But I just had equipment. So I did. I took, did five episodes, put them out. And then I was seeing, yo, the views, they're not happening. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> and you're thinking you did four hours, two hours of shooting this thing, there's another two hours of editing. And then you post and not many people come and see the thing. So I took a break for t almost two months, about a month and a half, mm -hmm. talking to these content creators mm -hmm. again to go back and say, hey, I did what you did, but hey, it's still not happening. <laughs> it's not working. It's not it's working. Not working. Mm -hmm. That's when they told me about the consistency. Mm -hmm. Get a schedule and go and work. I think one said there's times where your competition is just as good as you mm, mm. and i think that statement alone took away my ego mm, mm. to say look you're not the best out there deal with it exactly. get used to it mm. just be comfortable with, with the fact that there are many good people out there mm, mm, mm. and you're just one of many the only thing you can beat people who are just as good as you is outwork them that's it and from that time, I came on a heavy schedule and I was posting twice a week. And these are podcasts. Mm, that was mm. some heavy recording. I did that for two months. That took, got me to a thousand subscribers. And after that, we shifted to one per week. It took six months to get to a thousand. Mm -hmm. It took four months to get to 10,000 mm -hmm. after that. Mm -hmm. So it, mm -hmm. it was like... Mm -hmm. But I think it became that thing of talking to people who know how this game works. Exactly. And just humbling yourself to exactly. trust uh, the process and just work. Actually, you're saying something that I think there was a gentleman that said it. When when was it? Is it Pastor Jay or Pastor mm -hmm. Makubo? Mm -hmm. the men, uh, men's conference. Men's conference, yeah. yeah. To say, look, you need to identify, don't compete with the average. <laughs> <laughs> Look for those who are doing exceptional and tell yourself, how can I get there? Mm. Yes. How can I compete at that level? 
Mm. And what is it that they are doing that gets them there for me to get there? Mm. You know, because even myself, um, there's Simon Sinek. Um, I'm sure um, he yeah, talks a lot about. Know. Yeah, he 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 said that you need to look for a competitor who is within your space. Read about them without them knowing. <laughs> So there are a lot of people that I read about they have how no they do things. And the beauty about it is that don't don't be jealous of successful people. Mm. No. And don't be jealous of your competitors. And don't be jealous of those who are doing things best. No. Tell yourself, I want to learn how they do it. Mm. Because the, the temptation is that we get jealous of people. And the moment you get jealous, you start talking bad about them. Mm. When you when they mention the name of the person, you feel you feel like you cringe, you know, like can't be better than me. But unfortunately, they are better than you because they are doing things that they know things that you don't know. Mm. So sometimes you have to already operating yeah, at a level that exactly. you have arrived to. Sometimes you have to look yourself and say, you know what? Can I watch uh, Stevens? podcast and see how he does it and you just look yourself and just watch him and take notes and say you know what oh these are the things that he's saying this is the line of questioning he's doing this is the line of how he handled the, his uh, guest and this is how he thank his guest and then out of that go back practice and say I'm doing it so sometimes learning from people <laughs> privately watching your competitors privately <laughs> And the sisters, you know, because that's what I do. And I'll watch my competitors. How do they do it? If they say they do group mentorship, if they address the conference, how do they do it? How do they, what is their opening line? Okay. What kind of jokes do they share? And that's where you pick up something, Tando. Yeah. That most of the top uh, 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 prominent speakers, they repeat the same joke over and over. But Yeah, but I, I picked that up. <laughs> But no one get bored because they make sure they tell the joke. If they know they told it last, in the next session they might tell it differently, but the same joke. <laughs> you see? And so, because that is their trademark. Mm. That is their. So you can say, ah, you know what, the guy is boring. He's telling the same jokes over and over. But there are people who like it that way. You know. So at the end of the day, let's learn from our competitors if we want to do better. Have you seen an entrepreneur fall before your eyes that shouldn't have fallen? A, a lot of them. What would call what what are some of the reasons that you think brings people down? Good businesses down. It's um failure to be consistent, number one, not lack of consistency. Number two is not surrounding yourself with the right people that can advise you or ignoring the advices. Mm. Because in mentoring uh, Tando and advising, what I've picked up is that a mentor and advisor is like a preacher who may not have a car, but can pray for you to have a car. <laughs> <laughs> because what's happening is there are some people that you'd find that in terms of your... But also I think we as mentors or advisors... Mm. We also need to position ourselves right mm. for us to be able to be recognized for our work, right? True. Because sometimes we, I mean, here is a person, he invites you to say, come and advise us as a board. Mm -hmm. You come not even dressed smart or not looking good, <laughs> you know, and you expect the board members to give you attention. It may not, you mm. see. So sometimes we are the ones who fail the entrepreneurs, as advisors and coaches. As advisors, service providers. Mm. They don't fail on themselves. Because some, when they tell you their stories, you'll find that the business went down because of a professional accountant who was stealing money. <laughs> you, you understand? Or somebody who was not doing things the right way. Some because of the lawyer. Some because of this. So sometimes, uh, in as much as I believe that small businesses can fail, but I believe that we professional bodies... Or professional individuals, we are we, we because if we, even if you read the story of Hewlett, you read the story of whoever in this world, you'd find that there's a big 
somebody who would have done it better, who would have advised better. So sometimes we, we just have to say, if the business fail, the, the cost may not be what we see. It could be deeper than that. Mm. But it, it's just for us to say, do we agree that this small business can fail, but also we can fail the small businesses, you know. And 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 but yeah, in 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 a way, I wouldn't say they become arrogant because if you are an entrepreneur, sometimes you just have to be have that arrogancy, you know. To say, <laughs> it's uh, needed. It's yeah, you just have to have that, you know. And if you talk about pride, these are some of the things that comes with you know. And and it, it's just a matter of how do we balance things and all that. But in most cases, you'd find that. Lack of proper advice, lack of guidance, because a person can come to me and say, I want you to advise me. I want to start with, we are running this business, want advice. Guess what? They behave like a, a first year um, a student. You know, a first year student think that in a first year they know everything, <laughs> especially if they do law. In a first year, they can come and start advising everybody about, yeah, you know, the uh, prima facie, you know, and all that and all that. But go to year two, they realize, hey, I was still learning there, you know. So I believe that the same with entrepreneurs. If they sign up and say, I want you to be my advisor, in the first three months, they go along with you. But after three months, they think, ah, now I know everything. Why do I need this guy? You know, mm. and then things starts to deteriorate because by then the systems were not solid. By then the processes were not solid. By then things were not still solid, and you were still helping that you're going. To. I met a lot of people who said, "Please advise me," and after two months, they went went quiet. Mm. And I would think, "Am I? Did I do them something wrong? Did I say something wrong to this person?" And guess what? After three years, they come back. Some they come back and say, you know what? Thank you very much for what you've done to me. This is where I am. Our business is glowing and all that. And three months was good enough for them. Uh, not that it was good enough, mm. but they think it was good enough. Mm. But it was not, mm. right? Because after having told you that, they may come back and say, hey, things are bad. Don't you know a funder? <laughs> mm. <laughs> so what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm looking at is that Maybe if you start with the if you start a business with the eight, you know, in the in the old days when you go to driving school, they'll tell that there are eight key points mm -hmm. where you have to check your indicator before you drive, check the water, check the oil, check this, check that. Right. Mm -hmm. The same with business. If you set up your business and you have got the eight key points, make sure that you observe them always. Don't observe one, then you start to leave the other. Mm. You, you get me? So, because sometimes you'd find that people, business has failed because when you started, you put more money into marketing. Mm. But as the business now starts to take shape, you start to neglect the marketing. You take the resources, focus you start operations. paying your bills, and then you focus on operations. Marketing, there's no more money that was pumped into marketing. So, what a lot of people miss in their business is that they've got eight points that are aligned or that are listed in their business plan mm -hmm. or business concept or whatever because I fight it with a lot of people now when I talk about business plan. <laughs> they tell me, now it's a business case. Some they tell me, no, it's now a business canvas, business model canvas. Mm. It doesn't matter what you call it. Do you follow it? <laughs> <laughs> Do you follow it? Whatever you call it. I mean, in South Africa, an elephant in Louvre. In the U.S. is elephant. Mm. In but yeah, what remains is it's this big thing <laughs> <laughs> with a tail and with a you know the tasks and all these things. Mm. It remains that way. So whatever you call it, follow it. Mm. Yeah, have your eight key points. Follow them and know that we said we want to do this. But also allocate percentage to everything that you do. You must know that if marketing, what is my percentage on marketing on this and this and that, so that by the time you start deliverables, you, you, you can measure to say, did we achieve this on this? So you need to do that monitoring. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's something that you say when you're looking back, and I'm, it got me curious, is it harder to succeed in business now compared to 20 years ago? Actually, it's... Uh, it's easy now to succeed in business compared to 20 years ago. 
What's the difference that you see? The difference is that now you've got all the, the help that you may need. You have, um, I would say, platform where you can advertise without paying somebody. Mm. You can do it yourself, right? You've got crowdfunding, <laughs> you know, although in South Africa it may not be that strong mm-hmm. yet, but you do have those platforms where you can, you, you've got Google where you can search. If you failed, you don't have to wait for a mentor to come and tell you. You can check, you can compare, you can compare how other people are doing in uh, other countries, you know, how people are running their businesses. You can now benchmark yourself, you know. So there's a lot of information that you can use. And also, um, the, the beauty about it is that now you can diversify more than you would have done it before, you know, earlier. Because now you can you can run a business, you can multitask. You, so there are a lot of things that uh, now I think we are more on an advantage to become billionaires than the older generation. And if we don't become billionaires now, mm, it, it's 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 going to be it, it's going to be a I don't know, a shame on us, to be honest. And when you talk that way, Mm -hmm. actually, my next question is, for entrepreneurs, there's two things I'm worried about. Mm -hmm. One, and this one is the main one, entrepreneurs don't realize that they don't have, uh, how do I put it? They are not setting themselves up during the time of running and building their business for Mm -hmm. retirement. Mm -hmm. And they realize when they're 50, 60, that, oh, I didn't set up that thing. Mm -hmm. It's not like when you're in full-time employment where the company takes a portion and by force you're saving up for AMA retirement and Mm -hmm. it is a lot of entrepreneurs are in trouble and at risk there. The second one is the legacy that for entrepreneurs, how do they just work around planning for what they're leaving behind for the next generation, in particular their family. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. those two. A lot of entrepreneurs, I think, I always try and take the opportunity to warn them. They don't take retirement seriously. Mm -hmm. And when Mm -hmm. they're old, they realize the net worth of the business is not at a level where it can take care of you when you stop working. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing you, Nintendo, and I'm starting to think, to say what could be the... I think entrepreneurs have been taught to take risk. <laughs> Honestly, so you must take risk, you know, you must risk, you know, such that they risk everything. You know, they risk everything. There are opportunities that comes, you know, because as an entrepreneur, I'm looking for opportunities always. There are opportunities that may come, but I know there is a certain savings I cannot touch. Mm. Because that's not mine. It's for the family. Mm. So sometimes we take risk by investing everything into what we think it's going to make more money for us. But we end up losing more money on it. You see? So we need to, we need to have that mindset that says, from what I earn, from one rent, what goes towards my savings? What goes towards my entertainment? What goes towards my legacy what goes towards this if we can have that mindset it would be easier for you to know that if i have hundred thousand ten thousand will go towards my savings so much will go towards this so much will go towards this yes there are circumstances that may push you to spend money but make sure you don't touch what you have already committed towards a particular cause and also we need to understand that some of these savings, we may not do them on our own because of lack of discipline. Can you get a company that can say that you can put that money aside? Because some of these savings, it's not like they need a lot of money. Some you'd find mm. that it's only 200 rand a month, you know. Mm. But we, we, we as entrepreneurs, we have this mindset of, yeah, the banks, the savings, you know, these things, yeah, you know, if, if, if I can take uh, 10,000 and buy stock, I can make 30,000. But if I put it in the bank, I'm going, yeah, the difference is, the difference is, mm. you are not regulated by uh, a reserve bank. <laughs> <laughs> Where reserve bank tells you, you must make sure that you've got a saving, a reserves of maybe 35% or whatever percent against the money that you have, keep, you have kept. So you must mm. be, give it to us. 
we make sure that if you are liquidated, you can pay people. You're safe. Mm. Yeah, so with you, you don't have that luxury. So make use of people that are held accountable mm. to keep your money. You've got your whatever, you know, insurance companies, they are regulated. You are not regulated. So you can say you want to keep the money, I'm going to keep the money. Something happens drastically. So And you never know what's coming. You never know what's going to happen. So I, I believe that entrepreneurs can still do that and work around savings and all that. But we work with that hope that, you know what, I'm going to make millions. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and from the millions is when I'm going to make sure that my wife keeps or my daughter or my children keeps, my son will keep two million in their account. Even if you were to do that, they will still use it before your death. <laughs> <laughs> And when we talk about legacy, what, what's your thoughts around what do you, what are you going to leave behind for the family? Because for some, they leave businesses that are struggling mm -hmm. and because of the emotional significance of that business, the kids don't want to shut it down. They keep it. And, but now it becomes a source of pain and headache for the kids now because it's harder for them to shut down mm -hmm. the parents' business even though it's struggling. You see, there are certain professions or certain businesses. You, you cannot leave a legacy until you make a conscious decision to groom somebody that will carry on the legacy in a family. I'll give you an example, like being a medical doctor. What's going to happen if you die and your children never follow the suit? Right. Mm. So it, it's what's important is for you to communicate with your family. What are your aspirations? I mean, if you were to sit with your children, you've got four children every day. Mm. You make sure you take them to the surgery to see what you do to, so that they cultivate that love for what you do. And then they can decide and say, you know what? I want to follow these footsteps of my dad. You know? So most of the times as entrepreneurs, that's why when we die, all that the family will fight for is your cars, <laughs> your house. <laughs> no, not a business. Your house, everything. And by the time they are fighting, guess what? Your engineering company is locked down. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the only thing they know the executor of the estate is going to handle. But the rest, the, the, all that moves. <laughs> the sofas, they, the, your property, your... <laughs> They rip everything apart, right? And they only leave that thing. And they don't care how long. If you check most of the black businesses, or let me say businesses, you'd find that the estate has been going on, has been pending for 10 years. A person died in 2012 or 2000. They are still going through the executor process. Why? Well, nobody's got interest. They, they are done with the cash that they thought is the main thing, right? So... Sometimes it's very important that from your children, your family, if no one in your direct relatives or direct line has interest, go look for your son-in-laws or your, your, your brother-in-laws or whoever so that they can be able to take care and carry on the legacy and come on, on party. There are countries, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's Japan, where if there is no one who can be an heir, the family agrees to adopt Okay. A child that they are going to educate, make sure that they give them education, and make sure that they follow. They they are they are groomed to be a successor, or in the Business. estate of the family, so that when you die, it doesn't end just like that. You know, nothing is happening and all that. No, there has to be that continuity, right? And 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 unfortunately, you'd find that um, some families all they do is no one to carry over. They write and say. Mm, Two million goes to my dog, and this goes to charity, and all that and all that. You know, it does happen. Don't even if there are people that were going to think that they will inherit your wealth, some some of the rich people would even write off their wealth to charity, leaving their children with nothing. Why? Because they had no interest when I was still alive. So you have people in your family sell the sell the vision to them. <laughs> Make them understand what you're doing. How, what, what, how, I mean, I had a conversation with my daughter, I think, um, and, and I'm, I'm glad that she, 
I made it believe that there is business, well, life and all that. When I wrote a book, you know, business tips to my daughter mm. and dedicated it to her, you know. And and now her mindset has been that, Daddy, I want to start this. And then tomorrow, Daddy, I want to start this. Tomorrow, Daddy, I want to start this. And I was like, oh, great, you know. And and all that I would say is that for me, it was like that investment to say for her to understand that there's a business world. And, and, and to a point that even now when we talk, when we are talking, if I've got a business idea, I take it to her. And guess what? Yo, the criticism there, my <laughs> goodness. We're She's fine. Eh? To watch this, you know? We're fine. No, like, no, daddy, that's, ah, daddy, that's poor. That's, that's a poor idea. No, that's not going to work, daddy. But I remember, I think it was two days ago, a day ago or so, we're driving and I was like, I said, honey, what do you think about this idea? You know? And for the first time she was like, Daddy, that's great, man. Um, yeah, but you need to change here to change here to, you know, but but that, that can work. That can work. And I, I told this to her, I said, no, for the first time we are agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> but again, that is, for me, that's a legacy. Because now she gets to understand how she can run business, mm. how to do business. Because at the end of the day, I cannot leave her as a business advisor. Mm. No. And if I'm gone as a business advisor, I'm gone. But what is that she can point and say, Daddy taught me one, two, three, four. So some of these legacies may not necessarily be we're going to leave them in inheritance, but we can leave them wisdom and knowledge on how to do things better. Beautiful. <clears throat> and if you were to lose everything that you have now in 2024 mm -hmm. and start over what are your options yeah Let's say you are flat broke now. you just lost it all i can give a case in point there are good entrepreneurs that had great businesses mm -hmm. but happened to be in case it and and the floods came and we mm. wiped and everything entire business. everything wiped and all and that you discover your insurance can't cover that mm -hmm. so it means you have absolutely nothing and you're starting afresh if, if i were to start afresh um dando you give me one product that you can donate to me and i go and sell then i can multiply that <laughs> i can multiply that I, i've sold i've sold everything i've sold and uh, i've sold watches i've sold perfumes i've i've started a company that manufactures perfumes doing it in my own space in my own house and i saw it sell so i know what i'm gonna fall back to selling yeah so i can i can sell because business is about selling we sell time we sell value we sell anything so it is just that we get stuck into selling one thing mm. but we can sell everything <laughs> you see we, we get stuck into selling one thing because I don't have a car to reach there. I don't have this. I don't have that. But we can sell anything in business. And if we can sell anything, I can sell cars. You know, I, I can sell your car. You tell me I'm, I want to sell this car and I can try to market it and make sure that, you, you know what? Find me a customer. Let, let's get a customer. How long? When do you want to sell? And you'll get a call to say, hey, Derek told me that you're selling your car. <laughs> <laughs> and then you pay me the commission. So, so, and, and that, that make, makes me realize that actually, in as much as we are, I think what's important here, Nintendo, it's not about whether you can start a business or not. Mm. It's about you as a person. What is your determination to say, I want to earn so much a month? Got you. Because that will help you to say, if now I'm making 30000 a month as my determination, if I say I want to make 100000 is what I'm doing now enough to make me 100000 No. What else can I incorporate to complement my income so that I can make 100000 You will find it. The problem is we are more comfortable with the rent and cents that feeds our families. We don't want to stretch ourselves to go beyond and make and triple what we are earning. We don't have that in mind. Someone might not actually understand the first part of what you were saying, that you just find a product and sell. Mm -hmm. When you walked in here, 
You are saying you just <laughs> spent 20, 29 rands and sure. you made 20,000 or something. What are actual numbers? Um, that, that shocked me. I'm telling you. I walked into cash converters. I'll mention the name. I'm not advertising. Uh, please, <laughs> you guys who own the platforms, don't think we're advertising and then you censor it not to trend because you think we were mentioning the company. No, 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 no. This is a very practical example. Thank you. I went to cash converters. I saw this old painting. Mm. It's in a frame. It's in my car right now. Yeah. As I was coming to this uh, podcast, podcast I went there, it, it's, it's down the road. Then I said, okay, now that we agree that the time, and you said to me, no, be here at one o'clock exactly. <laughs> so I said, okay, fine, let me get there. When I walked in, I looked around and I saw this painting. It's an old painting. Um, you know those old painting and all that? Yeah. So, and then I took a picture. It, it's, it was selling for 29 rand. <laughs> Yeah. I took a picture, it says on Google Lens, it came out mm. in one of the eBay. Mm. Excuse me, that picture is selling for 1.4 US dollars on eBay. <laughs> the same picture. <laughs> yes, I know that there are those who would say, no, you need to check if it's original and all that, but it's so old. <laughs> right? <laughs> it must be original. And when I saw it, I left my wallet in the car. I went back to the car, came back, 29 rent, paid for it. It's in the car now. So meaning that now I've got something worth 19. So if if I'm going to be so desperate. This is not the first time you're doing this. It's not the first time. Trust me. Um, I went to a friend's house. Uh, guys, I'm not saying that. Please go and take the pictures of the old uh, granny's houses Someone and then you go and sell but I did that when you see a picture hanging even in your granny's house just take a picture and see if what is the value of that thing because online it will tell you what's the value I, I went it was a horse a beautiful horse by Andy something you know because also you check the signature of the person I took the picture and then I showed the guy I said hey chief did you see what the, the picture? it was sold for 5,000 US dollars online oh. mm. and guess what he did he said mom can i take this picture is <laughs> is dead pastor week child said can i take this picture and obviously mom was going to hang down everything you know you know the family and mm. fold it and nice he took it whether i sold it or not i don't know even now because he can't tell me because he can't give me my commission <laughs> <laughs> imagine so that thing that i bought now and then i found another picture it's a nice one you know and when i saw it it's um it's it's got your um greek uh, it, um, um, athens themes and all that i saw it also then i bought them too the other one was 50 rand but that one i did not get the value online but mm. because it's there online then it means that it's got a value, you know. So I think these are the things. And there's a show that I would watch sometimes. Uh, it's, it's in, um, you know, these uh, channels where you sell the old um, things, old stuff mm. and all that. They come and sell it and all that. I think we can start that in South Africa. Maybe we can make a lot of money uh, if they are doing that. But I know there are auctions and all that. You can take it to the guys and they can check it and tell you, oh, these things. So, so sometimes um, what's happening there, Tanro, is that there's a story of a guy who was cutting a tree, right? Cutting a tree, driving out, was going to um, throw away the tree. It was told by Miles Monroe in one of his talks. Then this guy asked for that tree, for that wood, and said, can you please give me, drop me in my yard. And the guy said, wow, really? You want to make fire? I said, no, great, leave it there. The guy made a beautiful sculpture of an eagle from that tree. Mm. And guess who bought the eagle? The same rich guy. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we, we, we uh, for me, it's about, as entrepreneur, do you see opportunity in every corner that you are at? You look at the guys who are selling um, ice creams or selling stuff for the robot. You think those guys are, those guys are, are going home with 500 to 1,000 a day. Mm. And if that is the money they are going away with, how much are they making a month? Over 30,000. The question is, do they see that themselves? 
they may not they may not mm. i think what hurts more is the people laughing at them and not making half that amount no no so so these are the things that we need to understand that when we talk about entrepreneurship it has nothing to do with you wearing a suit or a tie mm. no it has anything to do with your mindset if you decide that i want to sell something and you're consistent you're going to sell it there are people tend to with podcast are making millions mm. right and you tell you 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 check around and say hey, now yeah, hey, this is tough man hey, <laughs> must leave drop everything but i'm telling you five years down the line you'll start looking back and say wow wow with on studios and everything you look back and say wow guys now we are making it you know we are killing it because you've got teams that are going all over the countries because some of your teams will go to the US because some t- somebody would from the US and say you know what I want to feature in your podcast mm. and you have to travel to US and take the podcast record and come back and you know with the content and that's it you're sorted I you think know. that you're saying that because the reason why you put those cameras <laughs> going to Kenya in two weeks you, you see now the first one imagine because th- that's how it is and 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 it's not a waste of money you can't look at hey you know no, I'm, I'm, you know got to spend on a flight ticket and no the content you're going to get there it's going to take you the, the the challenge is one then <clears throat> that is that we are good in praying <laughs> <laughs> praying Father God, please bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. <clears throat> and then you sitting, the idea drops. Very big idea. And you're thinking, I no, this is not for me. What were you praying for? <laughs> What were you praying for when you say stretch my tent, you know, expand me, enlarge my territory? <laughs> What were you saying? Because when God does that, because actually there are certain things that do not happen because our capacity internally is not we are not ready to 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 contain it we are not ready to to receive these things but if we are ready as we pray ask yourself am i emotionally ready to receive what i'm praying for mm. am i mentally ready to receive what i'm praying for am i ready do i have a, do i have if i pray for lamborghini do i have 100,000 just to save is the Lamborghini. <laughs> you know. So there are certain things we just have to ask ourselves and say in as much as we pray how ready are we when we say amen mm. to implement or to receive the very same things that we pray for. So I think for me that as for me God and business they go together. Wow. Mm. This has been so insightful. I think one mm. question I have and I can't leave you let you go without this one. For business advisors who are struggling and have lost confidence in front of clients because now you can tell that look how am I going to advise a client on how to grow their business when I'm struggling and mm. I'm struggling for cash. I think you've coached enough business advisors to know that that's a reality out there. Mm, mm. What's your advice to them? The, the advice is that be an entrepreneur, don't be a beggar. <laughs> <laughs> don't be a beggar. I walked away from good deals, different many deals in my in my uh, service where you'd find that a company would come and hey, we are looking for business advisors and then they said to me uh, but yeah we pay you know we we are ngo npc what 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 we are rely on the funders and we pay so much and i'll tell them straight no that's not my look right. for others to do it that's not my rate my rate stands if you can't change and pay me what i'm worth I'm sorry i can't take it i might give you extra hours but my rate stands we can do. so the as a business advisor once you do that you create you you give confidence to somebody to say this person knows what they are doing so in most cases a lot of business advisors they would come and say uh, i'll advise you how much is your per hour no i don't do it per hour just give me so much <laughs> and no program no milestones nothing 
And because once you set the program and milestones, it means that if we agree that we're going to meet on the 17th, you don't make it. I must call you and say, why didn't you come? Because you will pay. You paid me for this. Yeah. So there are a lot of people that you find that they get paid, get, send the invoice, whatever amount, get paid, and then from there, move on with life as if nothing happened, you know. So, so don't remind, <laughs> don't remind your cases of business advisory. <laughs> I tend to, I'm not saying lawyers are reminding their cases because they, don't, they are paid. No, mm. I'm just saying don't remind, don't keep on postponing because now you are looking, chasing your clients. Mm. Take care of the clients, but please make sure that your pricing is correct. Because that's where the problem is. You'd find that the price. When I started, I put a model in place to say, I'm going to have fees that would say, if you want to see me for once off, this is how much. If you want to see me for six months, this is how much. If you're going to want to see me for 10 months, for 12 months, this is how much. Then from there, we know that 12 months, it may be a lot, but I will give you a good discount. Six months, this is how much you're going to pay. And you send the proper quotation to a person not verbal mm. when you send to a person they will keep it some will call you after two years and say hey I got your code now I'm ready you know mm. and when they say I'm ready it means that you have to say hang on <laughs> how much was it <laughs> oh yeah it was so but also don't remind them go to your files and say oh yes I remember you on this day but also keep people's numbers and because that's where people mess it up. <laughs> you lose context. No, I'm just saying, you can call me, Tando, after two years. I'll still call you by your name. Tando, oh. how are you? <laughs> Imagine somebody that you met two years back. You gave them quotation. Now they call you. Okonja, where did we meet? <laughs> <laughs> you have lost them. But if after two years, you are able to say, Hi, Gloria, how are you? I remember we met on this day and I gave you a quote. How are things going? No, actually, now I'm looking for you. I need you now. Oh, yes. Concha, I gave you a quote, yes, and it was so much, yes. Please note that our prices have increased by 12%. So now, can we revise it to this amount? Sure, I'm, I'm okay. Then you move on with business. Because one thing for sure is people need your services. They may not have money to pay you now, but they need your services. And if you maintain relationship, some of them, well, yeah, you can if you have capacity to send them emails, you know, hey, this is what we're doing. No, 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 no. But sometimes you can even call them after six months and say, oh, we met on this time. Are you still on that idea? Oh, yes, by the way, I was looking for you. I lost your numbers. Uh, please, can we meet? You know, so, so. Maybe what, what in, in, in a parting shot is that, Dando, the potential client you meet today mm. may be your client after six months or 12 months. Mm. So what does it mean? It means that every day, make sure you meet a potential client. <laughs> that is because after six sale. months, yeah. then you'll start, you'll start getting clients every day. But it's not the clients that you meet after six months. It's the client that you met today. Thank you. <laughs> That's powerful. And there's one thing I think I, I can add to what you've been saying, and mm. this is great. It's great for sales, for just the patience to build mm -hmm. the, the client base for yourself. But you said you created your demand as well when you were starting. Yes. You registered businesses, mm -hmm. and then you knew that the businesses that I'm registering, I'm going to advise, and some of them stayed, and some mm -hmm. stayed for exactly. years. So I think the advice would be to create that demand as well. To create a demand and understand that what you are building now is gonna the results will show after a period a it may not be now mm. no so unfortunately with a lot of entrepreneurs is they dish you know pamphlets and everything and think hey tomorrow let's go and wait people will call no they won't call they will call after collecting the third or fourth pamphlet <laughs> with the same content and the same relevance then they will trust you. <laughs> hey, this has been food for thought, food for the soul, food for everything. It's amazing talking to coaches.
Coach to coaches. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Ah, uh, thank you. I'm looking forward to come back. You know. No, uh, this is round one. This is round one. This is part one of a series. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so thank you for hanging with us, and it's just been beautiful. I know you took some notes, and from our side, it's see you on the next episodes. Thank you for all the support that we've been getting and that you're showing us. Let us know in the comments what you want the great man when he comes back to address, but we'll pick those things up and invite him back. So see you on the next episode.